Ski, what is your take on this new partnership between Waymo and Lyft? Do you think it's a threat to Uber's business? Um, honestly, I think that any partnership that can help autonomous cars get on the road is a great one. So I think there's space for a lot of players in the market and the idea behind Uber was always to take more cars off the road and, and create more safety for transport. So uh, obviously it can be competitive, but I think that it can always be a good, uh, good incentive for Uber to do more. I'm curious about your own experience at Uber. Obviously, Uber has had its fair share of PR issues over the last few months. Do you think that Travis Kalanick is the person who should still be leading this company? I actually... I actually chose Uber uh, because of interviewing with Travis. I think he's a great leader. A lot of what um, he comes out outside of the company is very different from what, how he is internally. I think he's always cared about the way and the direction of the company, and he's said many times that he was going to change. So um, obviously with a company that's growing so fast, when I joined Uber, we were like a little more than 100 people. Now there's over 6,000. It's really hard to to control, you know, the HR uh, planning and the team around a, such a high growth company. But I really think he's in the best interest uh, of Uber to keep such a devoted leader uh, on board. Now, Uber's quest for world domination has hit resistance in Europe, especially in Italy. Uh, some have tried to actually ban the app altogether. Right now, there's an appeals process going on. How do you think that issue will be resolved in Italy in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think Uber problems have been uh, um, seen across the world, but what is really strong is that users are really behind the app and they really want to use it. And this we've seen also in Italy, um, the users being very loud and consumer organizations really being loud defending um, the battle that Uber is trying to uh, bring on in Europe, which is to actually liberalize markets that are way more closed than actually you can see in the US. So with very few licenses for tra taxi drivers, and these licenses owned by the actual drivers. It's very hard to, for politicians to stand behind you know, uh, new innovation and competition. But what we, we've seen is that users have really stood up uh, for the app and for new types of services. And if you come to a European city where Uber works properly, like London, everybody is like loving it and it's, it's, it can be done. I think there has to be a new regulation put in place, but this new regulation has to foster innovation and new leaders in Europe are much more conscious about uh, the importance of innovation. So I'm, I'm very hopeful about uh, uh, new trends for apps like Uber, but not just Uber to uh, really manage to penetrate the European market. I wonder about that, though, because just last week, a senior advisor to Europe's highest court recommended that Uber has to follow, you know, very tough transportation rules, just like every other company. I mean, how is Uber going to overcome all of this resistance? I mean, is it simply by sheer force of will? Um, no, I think that actually it's a lot of a technicality. So the European law actually does not regulate transportation. Transportation and local transportation is left at a local level. And this has created a lot more problems than many other technology companies which have uh, been able to, you know, be um, facilitated by regulation that is actually a European wide. So the part, the point that is very important to, to notice and to uh, underline is the fact that at a year EU level, very little can be done about local transportation rules. So this is a little bit uh, the struggle that uh, Uber, but also not just Uber, there's also companies like Blablacar, who is a carpooling company, and it's a French company, and so it's born in Europe, it's also a unicorn, but they had seen a lot of struggles also because regulation around carpooling is not very clear uh, in the European market. Now I want to talk about your new personal savings app, Obel Money. Um, you say it's powered by collective intelligence, so basically marrying the wisdom of the crowd plus machine learning. How is this different from other savings apps on the market? 
Yeah, I think that a lot of saving apps in the market are very passive. They allow you to do saving through roundups, for example, or saving through algorithms. What we've really focused on is trying to find a way, and we've teamed up with a lot of behavioral economists to find ways that we can nudge saving behavior positively. So what we've created is steps. It allows users to link uh, saving to their behaviors, like, for example, running, and you can run a certain number of miles and uh, save every time you run, or uh, maybe link it up to your social media and save every time you check into places so this allows to cre a creation of like a little bit more of a gamified solution and making saving a little bit more of a multiplayer and uh, challenging uh, kind of experience that with gamification can help users really um, get traction and actually our first results um, have been very positive because we see people increase the amount of saving every week right. over time